Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Kelly here of GoPro Wrestling, and it is an honor and a privilege to be sitting next to the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. Isn't that right? The Honky Tonk Man. Don't ask me. I mean, I know it already. No, certainly the greatest. <laughs> Honky, we were overwhelmed with questions on all our social media pages. Uh, I mean, we've got a lot of great questions, a lot of from the current, so we'll just bounce around uh, what your thoughts of today's uh, current state of wrestling and, and a lot of yeah, memories sure. you had from the past. Uh, first question comes from Steven Mancuso. He asks, what kind of beer or alcoholic drinks does the greatest IC champ of all time drink when traveling with the WWF in the 1980s and 90s? Ha. Huh. I was always just a traditionalist when it came. The the beers, you know, it was a German beer sometimes, and Budweiser, Bud Light, and all the normal nonsense. I was never a big uh, whiskey guy, Jack Daniels and stuff. I got kind of sick on it when I was in college as a young college kid and drinking that stuff, and I never had a taste for it. And then uh, I drifted off into the into the vodka thing for a while, and then uh, I don't even do any of that anymore. A uh, couple of beers for me now, that's good enough. That's, that's fine. And the follow-up question is, is, what wrestlers cannot hold their liquor or hang with the boys? Gosh, I, I don't... I, I just, most, of, most of the boys were all, you know, the guys that were drinkers, uh, drank a, a lot, and they always held their liquor pretty well that I know of. Now, there were guys that never drank at all. Uh, you know, Jerry Lawler, my cousin, Jerry, never never had a drink of any kind of alcohol, and... I don't even know if Jerry takes aspirin. I mean, he, he's very straight-laced on all that. Jimmy Hart's the same way. Jimmy Hart's the same way. And uh, uh, other than that, everyone, uh, even Andre held his liquor pretty good. I mean, he drank a lot of it, too. <laughs> so. Is the stories correct? You've seen Andre? Like, he was, the, the legend's correct that he would drink, like, 200 beers? And You know, I never saw him drink 200 beers, but I, he would always have, like, Ten bottles of wine that was in the locker room, and or whatever would come in those boxes of wine, six, eight, and he would ha always have those. But I mean, gosh, he was a giant, so, and he was the boss, and he he did what he wanted to do. He was a great guy, though, good good to be around. Except when you'd see him in the bar, we I would all, I mean, it was I tell the story sometimes when I go out and do my comedy stand up one man show about hiding from Andre, because I lead into the story about Andre, if he liked you, he liked you, if he didn't like you, he really terrorized you, uh, like he'd terrorize Jake Roberts, he'd stand on Jake's hair and pull him by the arm, get up, well you can't really get up for guys standing on your hair. <laughs> Why you never like Jake, there's always... I have no idea, I mean maybe Jake can answer that question, uh, Andre obviously can't, he's not around, uh, he, he, for some reason he took a disliking to John Studd, and he just physically beat John Studd up every night until John just finally quit the business. I mean, he physically beat him up. I'd see it. John would come back to the locker room just beat like, gosh. He liked me, so he didn't beat me up, and I was glad. <laughs> and he liked my son. My son was a little small kid at the time, and my son would stay in the locker room and lay in my bag because I would tell him, you stay and watch my bag, and Andre always thought that was really neat. Here's a four-year-old kid that would stay in the locker room where your dad's out performing and lay there and lay beside her in my bag to protect my bag. And, and Andre would set him on his lap and tape his wrist up for him and while Andre was playing cards and drinking his wine. And, uh, but I, if you went to the hotel like where we are now and downstairs, you go in, when you go through the lobby to go to your room, the bar's right there. He have, would have a corner table, corner at the bar, <laughs> and if he saw you, come here, come on. I don't want to sit in here till 3 in the morning with Andre because you have to drink with him. <laughs> I would try to find a back door or something if I knew he was there to sneak in so, and hide so he didn't see me. And, but if he wanted you in there and he saw you and you didn't come in, then the next night, Get away. Uh, Jason Keaton wants to know about your time in Stampede Wrestling and what it was like being stretched by Stu Hart in the dungeon. I never got to go, I never went in the dungeon, so I never got stretched there. I know people that did, and I've seen video of it now. Uh, Brett had a tape, an audio cassette tape of some kid uh, getting uh, terrorized in the dungeon by Stu. And Brett probably still has that tape. He carried it around with him for years and would play it when... Uh, for everyone, 
Uh, and I did see a video not so long ago on YouTube of, of Stu working some young kid over. Uh, I heard the horror stories, and I had been around the business long enough to not venture in and say, you know, here I am, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wrestler, knowing that Stu Hart's like going to a real wrestler. Uh, I'm an entertainer. I, was, I never knew how to do any wrestling. And, but I, I enjoyed working up there. I didn't, I didn't realize how grueling the territory was, especially in the wintertime, because in the summer we didn't work very often there. Uh, Stu only ran Calgary on Friday, Edmonton on Saturday, and uh, a spot show around somewhere on, on like a... Uh, a Wednesday or a Thursday, so the summer times were, were were very easy. The winters now, of course, is brutal. Uh, snow being knee deep and and uh, just terrible, terrible cold weather. I left the beach in Pensacola, Florida. I had cowboy boots, blue jeans, and my college jacket, letter jacket from college, and a sweatshirt. Three days later, it's minus thirty or forty degrees up there. It was horrible. And uh, the conditions were just bad, but we drew big crowds. And I went there with a guy named Dr. D. David Schultz, who was famous for uh, for slapping around the John Stossel ABC TV guy. And uh, and and uh, Dr. D. and I, we went there as partners. Then I turned on him, and we had that place on fire for about a year, year and a half. It was really, really good. And of course, being around ten. Heart kids is, is a chore within itself, with and they all want to be stars and bookers, and they all know everything. And but I enjoyed it, and had a, I've got to have a good relationship with Brett and all those kids, every one of them. Uh, that's the ones that's still around. I love them all to death. They're great, great people. Did we have our ups and ups and downs? Oh, of course, yes, always. I mean, what what is? I felt like I was part of the family. So, but I never went to Sunday dinner up there. I don't know if I could handle that. I want to be fair to you because you got a lot of unfair criticism online because um, when you were just having fun about Bret Hart having his stroke, yeah. a lot of people took it to heart yeah. that you were just making fun of Bret, but they don't realize no. the, the relationship you have with him. No, it was fine. Bret and I have been, we've been friends since day one that I went up there and that had nothing to do with it. It was a, it was a, it was a funny story that the online people always parse words and take things way, way, way too seriously and read too much into a lot of things. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I get hate mail now because people say I, Jake Roberts started a story that <coughs> I tried to buy. He tried to buy my name. He tried to steal my name. I didn't try to buy his name or steal his name. If I wanted to buy his name, I would have bought it. All you got to do is go to trademarks.com and look it up. And, and that had nothing to do with it. And it's so... But to some of the fans, oh, you're picking on Jake. and Even Piper. Piper, he tried to buy my name. I didn't try to buy his name. I tried to trademark the names. That they, these guys don't have them trademarked. You know, you're silly to be in this business and not have your name trademarked. You know, here's the thing about Roddy, and, and, and I, I feel... I will always, I'll feel bad about this now forever because he had started his podcast, and he wanted me on the podcast... And his people had reached out to me, and I said, okay, when we get over to uh, Stockton, California for the Stockton Con uh, last year, I, Roddy was going to be there, and I said, sure, we'll sit down and hammer it all out, and I'll, I'll do the show. And then we get over there, and Roddy, of course, passed away that, that, that week of that show, so I never got to see him, and we never got closure on, uh, on this thing about whatever it was. I know it wasn't about the trademark or anything, Roddy just thought it was kind of bizarre that I would go out and try to do these things. But Gene Simmons has like 10,000 trademarks. Vince McMahon trademarks your name and everybody goes, oh, Vince is a great guy. But when someone else tries to trademark something, it's like, um, you're a bad guy. It's actually pretty smart if you did try to. I mean, uh, well, I mean, the... it's business. You know, I mean, as you grow older, you're not going to be working and reap some rewards off of things, and they, oh, you want to make money off of somebody else's back. Isn't that what this world of economics is all about, making money off of people? Oh, you want to make money off people. Vince makes money off people. You love him. Let's run the subject of trademark. 
<laughs> you, you did trademark your own name before going to WCW, right? Because you were uh, able to use it? or No, I didn't. I didn't do that till after. I created the name. It was my creation. And, of course, Vince McMahon, WWE, tried, they, did, they did sue me uh, over the name and the likeness and all these things. And uh, I had to hire uh, what was called a uh, trademark and intellectual property lawyer. Intellectual property is when you create something. It's you, you, Technically, you don't really, really have to trademark uh, something, but if you really want it protected for sure, then you trademark. It's 275 bucks. You get it trademarked for like 10 years. Uh, but when I, after I went to WCW and they were opening TNA, and I thought, you know, I might should protect this thing a little better than it just being intellectual property. And because in my contract with WWE, once then the lawsuit with them was over about the intellectual property deal, that's part of my deal with them now. They have the right to use my name any way they want other than put it on someone else. They can't do that. But they have the rights to, to for use. And that's that was my deal with them. It's called original intellectual property. And people out there, if you... You guys on the internet, if you'll just go and do a little research. You know, the sad thing is, you guys don't want to do your research. You want to sit here and think, well, everything that Jake's saying is true. Everything the Honky Tonk Man is saying is true. Everything that Ricky Steamboat says is true. If you have one iota of a question about it, do some research. I have people go, I understand you have you got a copyright on your name. No, I have a trademark. There's a difference between trademark and copyright. Here's his questions. He typed these out. This is a written material. Technically, he owns this piece of paper. That's called a copyright. Honky Tonk Man is a name that's trademarked. Two different things. Now, that's legal 101. You all guys owe me. I just hope it clears up some of this nonsense that, that I've heard for years.